will you send the PPT after this meeting to our, yes, we will send you the PPT along with this recording which is being done. All right. We have Shishir from Bangalore and kindly give more examples so it is easy to understand. Yes. Right. So instructor will give you the proper examples. So let's start now. It's already at six. All right. All right. So Okay. So welcome to the session number one. And this session is going to be two hours duration, not three hours. It will be two hours duration. And the overall objective is to, to understand the big data that will be covered in the first first half. Then after, then after first half, there will be 10 minutes break, and there will be a, then we'll cover the Hadoop architecture. The session is being recorded, and recording and presentation will be shared with all of you. And so, except for the instructor, everybody is muted. And so, please ask your questions by typing in the questions window. Instructors will read out the question before answering. And so, and to get your answers uh, properly quickly, please uh, avoid the sort and avoid the chat language. Okay, it becomes difficult for the instructor to read out the question quickly. And uh, this is session number one out of our around twelve sessions on big data and Hadoop course, and it suffices as an intro to big data, big data technologies. The rest of the course will have fewer attendees. Today's uh, session generally have more attendees. And um, rest of the course will have maybe up to 20 people in the class. And you will be able to see each other's questions in the rest of the session. Today, you will not be able to see each other's questions. Uh, yeah, we have somebody raising hand. Yeah. Yes, Ashish, you have a question. All right, all right, so so Vasudha's question is, is it okay to, uh, if you know a database like Java, uh, a database like Java and a language like C++, so Java is, uh, okay, database like Oracle, okay, that's what you meant, Vasudha, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's more than enough, actually, that's more than enough for to become a Hadoop developer. Okay, and I'm a C++ developer. What are the things I should learn to start with data? That's Kalyan's question. Ideally, you would not need to know new things. Just a basics of overview of how does a Java code looks like should give you enough confidence. Okay. We have Mauricio from Uruguay, and he's a software developer in Node.js and PFP, great. Welcome, welcome Mauricio. And uh, I hope you like the sessions. So Ashish's question is, how is Hadoop different from Spark and Zeppelin? So I think instructor will be able to answer you well this question. Okay, so let's start and then we can have these questions. All right. All right, so these are the 11, 11 sessions. These 11 sessions are generally become a little bit more and they become 12 sometimes. And uh, since we have expanded our course by expanding Spark and by including more, more topics, the sessions have become 12. All right, so in today's class, we will basically cover up to the components of Hadoop. And since it's a two hour session, the HDFS architecture and name node may not be covered today. Okay. And uh, yeah. So all right. So let me let me introduce uh, introduce uh, no big data. So first of all, welcome to no big data. And the no big data's unique proposition is first in expert instructors. For example, today's instructor you will get to know. Is uh, in is an expert in, in the technology and domain, 
And the other unique position from no big data is Cloud Labs. So Cloud Labs is our unique way because the way we observed in the real industry, real big data industry, the way in, in, in an enterprise, a developer get to use the Cloud Labs. We set up the similar, similar solutions. Okay. Next is we provide access to LMS. What does it mean by LMS2? We provide the, the slides, the whole course material, recordings, assignments, quizzes, everything is available in LMS for your life, lifetime work. And those candidates who perform really good in, in sessions, they finish all the questions available in LMS, they get to work on real life projects if they want. We provide a course completion certificate, and we also provide a 24 by 7 email support to all of our students. And no big data alumni, uh, we, we have formed a group of no big data alumni so that you can stay connected to the industry. You you get keep on getting a newer content, as in when say our Hadoop 1.0 students got to know about Hadoop 2.0 for free. And similarly, we keep on sending them newsletters along with the along with the jobs. Okay. All right. So let's get started. And uh, okay. So yes, Hari Prasad. Rest of the sessions are paid sessions. Right. Okay. So again. So today's. Today's instructor is going to be Swati, and I will I'll make Swati presenter so that she can take it from here onwards. All right. So Swati will introduce herself. And then Swati, then Swati will take all your questions. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, uh, are you able to hear me? Is my vo voice audible? Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll share my screen and. Uh, um, I'll, meanwhile, I'll give you a, a little bit of uh, introduction about uh, uh, myself. Okay, so uh, can you, can you uh, see the screen? Okay, great. So, hi all, uh, I am uh, Swati uh, and uh, so are you able to see the slides? Uh, Okay, uh, just a second, let me just fix this.
so uh, can you see the um, the ppts alongside like uh, Uh, so uh, let's start. Uh, I'll give you um, um, I'll give you a quick introduction about uh, myself. So I am Swati, and uh, I uh, I am a graduate in uh, computer science from uh, PS Institute of Technology, uh, Bangalore. After my graduation, I uh, I joined uh, the biggest e-commerce uh, company in India called uh, Flipkart.com. So most of you must be aware about Flipkart. Uh, so, uh, I worked for a couple of years at Flipkart and uh, post Flipkart, uh, I joined a company called Cubol. So, I, I'm currently uh, working at Cubol. Uh, Cubol is basically a big data analytics platform. So, um, we basically uh, enable the big data infrastructure for our users. To run their uh, workloads and to run to analyze their data, etc. So uh, that is what we typically do at Cubol. I'm also a guest instructor at No Big Data. So uh, okay, uh, before I start, uh, I just want uh, feel free to stop me at any at any given point of time. If you have any questions, just feel free to stop me, and uh, you can uh, type in your questions through the questions uh, questions window, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Okay, yeah, so it's uh, it's called Cubol. Yeah, we have a couple of more uh, joinees. So hi, uh, hi Kushal. Um, welcome to No Big Data. Okay, uh, so as as in uh, like more more people are joining, uh, but uh, meanwhile we'll begin with the uh, today's uh, session. Okay, so uh, before we start the session, we will. Uh, I'll begin by asking you uh, the most important and the very basic question: What is it that you understand by big data? So, what what is big data? When when we talk about big data or when you hear the term big data, what is it that you understand by it? Uh, what comes in your mind when you when you talk about big data? So, basically, what is big data? Uh, you you guys can answer uh, through the questions window. Correct. So uh, Vasudha says that big data is huge amounts of data. Good. Correct. Uh, unstructured data. Tirumal says it's unstructured data. Okay. Large amounts or chunks of data which becomes a bit difficult to manage on a daily basis. Okay. Huge data, something which hardware cannot handle. That is what Hari Prasad says. Okay, volume, velocity, variety. Yeah, that is uh, the standard definition from IBM. Good, correct. Information gathered in, uh, information generated in vast quantities. Structured or unstructured, typically used for analysis for patterns. Uh, that's Ramesh's answer. Okay, uh, great. So yeah, uh, looks like most of you understand uh, what big data is. And uh, okay, Vasudha says something that cannot be easily retrieved and analyzed using, using normal RDBMSs. Okay, great. So we have a great set, a great set of answers. Uh, uh, looks like most of us are pretty comfortable with uh, um, the definition of big data and most of us understand what what do we mean by big data great so uh, let's let's begin by uh, defining big data so what is what is big data essentially so big data is very in very very simple terms in in layman uh, terms big data is data of very big size so when when you have huge amount of data you call it big data also, one of the other few characteristics of big data is that you can't process the data that you have with the usual tools. So uh, assume that you have a certain amount of data and uh, you can't store that data using just 
one hard disk or maybe you cannot process data you cannot derive insights out of date or out of that data using your own uh, personal computer or uh, so when when you can't process that data using uh, using the normal computers or when you can't store that data in in the normal hard disks it it is basically that that shows that the data is huge in size and it is big data and we need distributed architecture for it what do we mean by distributed architecture basically when you need multiple machines to process your data or multiple hard disks to store your data you you basically talking about distributed architecture you're talking about multiple machines you're talking about multiple computers multiple disks so your data is basically distributed over various devices and this is this is essentially what distributed architecture is so big data is a data of very very big size and to process that data or to store that data you need distributed architecture also like some of you already mentioned that big data could be structured as well as unstructured data so uh, can 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 uh, you give me example uh, can some of you give me example about uh, uh, of some structured data big query okay ramesh says big query twitter feeds as unstructured tirumal correct okay rainfall data collected at a place okay okay fb posts application logs forum chatter medical records correct uh, articles okay so uh, weather reports bio patterns these are some examples of unstructured data can you uh, give me examples of structured data as well transactions all the rdbms apache logs okay okay yeah great set of answers there uh, so yeah typically structured data is something where we understand the data we know the various uh, fields that the data cons consists of and we know the data types of all the fields so this is typically structured data uh, for example uh, in an e-commerce company when a com when a uh, when you go and you place an order the 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 e-commerce company usually tends to store that order related information in into a database now they know all the fields about that order be it order id order uh, the product id product name customer's address and so on so they this is an example of structured data where you know what the data actually contains and the data types of each of the fields etc so this is an example of structured data unstructured data is basically where we don't we basically do, do not know much about the data Uh, for instance what is it that the data contains what are the various fields that the data has we definitely do not know about the data types so um th that that is an example of unstructured uh, that is basically unstructured data and we got some very very good set of examples as answers so weather reports medical records um of uh, uh, tweets from twitter um all of these are examples of unstructured data your emails your regular emails web pages your web uh, web pages um, word documents all of this are all of these are basically example of unstructured data okay good so basically uh, we now understand what is big data so big data is simply data of very very big size so that is the thumb rule and we're going to stick with this definition yeah correct uh, so shishir has a very very good question he he is asking is in most of the data collected these days ha they have uh, structures as well because tweets can be classified by the topic address of the person who posted them definitely so these these the data that we spoke about like tweets or emails or web pages they de they definitely have an internal structure 
for example emails also have a subject line and the from address to address and then they have the um, email body the tweets have the the actual you know set of characters but more more often you will see that you know we use these the the text and the tweets for things like sentiment analysis which we'll talk about in the further slides so the tweet itself is an example of unstructured data when when you basically process the tweet to understand uh, for example if it is a negative tweet or if it's a positive tweet what is the sentiment being uh, you know being presented from the tweet so that becomes an example of unstructured data so it, it definitely we know who who's the person who's tweeted it what time was it tweeted and stuff but the tweet itself is unstructured are not weather report structured data all the daily weather information is stored in some sort of database with fields where data is known correct so vasudha also has a uh, has this question where she is asking weather reports these these days are structured yes so it depends upon uh, you know um, basically depends on the report type there are multiple ways in which you can capture weather reports for instance uh, the weather report yeah so you're seeing the desktop as well as the uh, the presentation simultaneously so that i can see the questions uh, at the same time okay yeah so answering vasudha's question uh, weather reports these days because we've been you know uh, gathering this data over a longer period of time we have start, we've analyzed this data so much over uh, over the over the last few years and over the over the years that we understand that uh, so is there any trouble in viewing the uh, presentation are you able to see the slide okay great yeah so but uh, we have we have started understanding uh, understanding the format of the data since we've been collecting it over over the last couple of years so it's it's you know we're trying to convert these unstructured data into structured data but still you will see that uh, a lot of these weather informations uh, are are still it could be you know zip code based okay i'll Okay, so I have. Uh, okay, let's. Uh, Vasudha, I'll answer your question later. Uh, I think we'll move ahead. And uh, um, okay, so we'll quickly discuss about the types of computing. Uh, so we now, now that we understand uh, what is big data, and that's the thumb rule. Big data is essentially data of very, very big size, and it needs distributed computing. Okay, uh, great. So let's move ahead and uh, let's now try and try and answer what is distributed and parallel computing. So distributed computing is is a field of computer science where uh, the the computation is done um, where a group of computers talk to each other over a network. So uh, the the computers they all want to achieve a, a common goal they are trying to process they are trying to solve a problem and they are all trying to do it in conjunction and these these computers uh, they they talk to each other over over a network so this is what distributed computing essentially is what is parallel computing parallel computing is you can think of parallel computing as a very big problem which is further divided into smaller sub problems and then each of these sub problems is picked up by picked up by a process uh, each of these um, sub problems is then solved in parallel so for example consider that you have huge amount of uh, uh, numbers you have basically a, a a set of integers which you want to um, sort so what we can do here essentially is we can divide the sorting problem into multiple sub problems and each of the processor can then parallelly sort their set of numbers so this is essentially what parallel computing is so there are two different types of computing distributed computing and parallel computing distributed computing is where a, a group of computers try and solve a problem by uh, uh, try and solve a problem and the way they communicate is over the network parallel computing is where a given problem is divided into multiple sub problems and the pro and multiple processes then then pick up these sub problems 
to try and solve them simultaneously to achieve a faster throughput to basically give uh, to basically give the result faster so are all of us clear about uh, the different types of computing distributed and parallel computing okay okay great let's move ahead okay so uh, we already so this slide uh, basically talks about data variety we already spoke about uh, this uh, structured semi structured and unstructured data and uh, given the given the brilliant set of answers that i had uh, i am assuming that all of you understand the difference between structured semi structured and unstructured data if you have any questions at this point of time please uh, feel free to ask i can uh, i'll quickly um, explain a little bit about semi structured data i'll i will quickly give some example so um, semi structured data is where you understand the fields in the data but you might not know the data types so uh, example of semi structured data is could be xml documents or json data or csv files where you know what are the fields contained in the data but you might not know about the data types so that is an example of semi structured data so so data basically is divided into structured semi structured and unstructured data and uh, um, i i would just like to share a, fa uh, a, a fascinating thing here that the amount of data that actually okay the amount of data that actually exists uh, structured data accounts for only 5 to 10% of that so structured data is really really very small most of the data that we see uh, the most of the data that gets generated is basically unstructured data or semi structured data okay so shridhar has this question as to how can xml be a semi structured data so um, so if you've seen a xml document or uh, so basically what xml says let's consider again uh, the example of orders placed in an e-commerce website so the order can have multiple attributes like order id product id product name order value and customer's address uh, so xml data basically contains the closing tag the um, the starting tag and the closing tag and so basically it can have something like order id 1 2 3 4 uh, within the order id tag and the order the product id within that tag and the product name say it could be you know uh, a book on big data uh, things like that so but you might not know what data type is order id it could be just plain uh, you know numbers or it could be a combination of alphanumeric characters so you might not know the data type of order id so this is how xml becomes a semi structured data so json data is also semi structured where you have order id and product id and so on but you might not know it, what data type each of these is actually is so product id could be alphanumeric characters or it could it could be just plain integers so you 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 don't know about the data type um, and hence it becomes semi structured so uh, shridhar did i answer your question yeah correct so i mean examples do have xsds where definitions are defined but uh, there could be you know uh, xml files wherein these might not be defined so very yeah so the order the the entire order as as such can have order number item id ship to bill to address like santosh is saying and we might not know uh, the we might not know the data types of each of these uh, fields okay okay let's move ahead so uh, we already answered what is big data and we we said that the thumb rule is that big data is data of very very big size however um, there are always industry definitions and you know standard definitions for uh, each of these technologies and the industry definition of big data basically says 
uh, that big data is something which has volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. This is a definition by IBM. Uh, IBM keeps adding more and more keywords and uh, to this definition. I think recently they added added value as well. So uh, basically, these four are characteristics of big data: volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. Uh, let's go over each one of them one by one. So volume. Um, volume is what we already spoke about a data which has a lot of volume a data which is very huge in size uh, example of it could be um, consider facebook facebook generates around uh, 500 terabytes of data per day so the volume of data that facebook generates is so huge and by virtue of the volume the data that facebook generates becomes big data velocity velocity is data in motion uh, you can think of it as data which is being accumulated or which is being generated in a very very fast pace so we can reconsider uh, so uh, facebook can again be an example here so many users are connected to millions and millions of users are connected to facebook at any given point of time and all of them are you know writing status messages posting pictures posting videos liking uh, stuff and commenting on uh, pictures and stuff so a lot of data is being generated at a very very fast space a uh, very very fast pace so uh, that is uh, and by virtue of the velocity this becomes the a lot of data is getting accumulated and this becomes big data okay next is variety so sometimes you might see that the the volume of the data isn't very huge but because of the variety of the data because of the various various types of uh, information uh, within the data it becomes a big data problem one of the examples here could be google maps so uh, a, a map of a country might be just you know uh, 200 gigabytes but because of the complexity uh, it becomes a big data problem so basically if you have to find uh, um, a route between two cities for a given country you might have to you know you will have to do a graph traversal and you'll have to find the shortest distance and you will have to find the um, You'll have to keep in mind about the traffic and you know roads being closed and stuff and because you you the data itself is so complex although the data size is, isn't very huge but the data itself is so complex it has such a huge variety of data it becomes big data so uh, that is one another characteristic of big data the fourth characteristic is veracity what is veracity veracity is um, data in doubt when you essentially do not know um you know you you do not know what the data really contains is it you know something that you should consider or is it something that you should discard basically um the data has a lot of inconsistencies and incompleteness because of the ambiguities in the data you do not know whether you 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 should consider this data for further processing or not so the data in, isn't you have a lot of ambiguities in the data and to clear these ambiguities you have to process process the data to find out if it is if it if, if the data if this uh, piece of data makes sense or not so vasudha to answer your uh, initial question here weather reports right so um, consider there are three different devices who, who are measuring um, who are measuring weather for a given city one of it is measuring weather based on zip codes the other is measuring uh, weather per uh, it's giving a per hour reading based on um, um the geospace uh, the the location coordinates and there is another one who's who, weather data which is giving very fine grained data uh okay uh, okay i'll complete this slide and reach i'll go back to the previous slide to answer your question okay so i was giving an example uh, vignesh are you able to hear me
yeah correct so i'll uh, so i was giving an example of veracity veracity is when the data is in doubt uh, so uh, for an for example you you've collected weather information from three different devices one device gives you um, data per hour based on zip code the other gives you data per minute based on uh, the location coordinates and the third device gives you data uh, per uh, per minute based on zip code so basically you have you know three different devices which are giving you data in three different formats in three different granularities one uh, and one of them could be reliable some of them could be reliable some of them could be unreliable so this is basically data in doubt where you have to process all of this data to understand whether this data actually makes sense or not so that is an example of um, veracity okay uh, i'll move back to the previous slide to just quickly answer uh, reach's a uh, question okay so uh, the cross and the tick mark essentially means that the structured data in structured data you know both the field and the field data types in semi structured data you don't know the data types and in unstructured data you know none none of these values so reach did i answer your question okay uh, okay so shridhar has a very very brilliant question he is asking where well, if you or if you don't know or if you're doubtful about the data how can you process it so uh, uh, shridhar this is essentially where big data comes to your rescue so you have to analyze a lot of this data over a very long period of time and an you bring you know uh, derive meaningful patterns out of this data over a period of time so that when the next set of data comes in you can basically use the history that you've analyzed over a given period of time to understand the new data that comes in so um, you basically collecting a lot of this data uh, which is which could be ambiguous which could have which can have inconsistencies etc over a period of time and then you try to identify patterns you see that so in in the example that we just discussed you see that uh, the the report which gives you the weather uh, readings per minute based on the zip code has been giving you consistently you know wrong weather readings over a over a period of time so when this weather reading comes the next day you basically based on the historical pattern you can understand whether to consider that data or not okay so uh, we'll move uh, ahead and uh, okay so uh, we we'll move ahead and i can you can you guys answer a very very simple question how many bytes are there in a petabyte okay shishir says 1000 gb okay uh, tirumal says 1000 terabyte okay 10 to the power 6 one kilo terabyte 10 to the power 16 okay okay great great uh, okay ramesh's answer has a lot of zeros okay 10 to the power 15 okay great great so uh, how many petabytes uh, sorry how many bytes in one petabyte yes there are 10 to the power 15 it's basically 10 to the power 15 so 10 to the power 15 bytes in one petabyte how you how can you easily remember this 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 is a table which uh, quickly tells you that uh, one kilobyte is essentially 1024 bytes one megabyte is 1024 kilobytes one gigabyte is 1024 megabytes and so on so one petabyte is essentially 1024 terabytes most of you got it correct so great and like all of us know one byte is 8 bit 
okay great so let's let's move ahead yeah so this is an interesting question is one petabyte big data what what do you people think about this do you think one petabyte of data is big data okay why yes and why no uh, why do you think there is data more than this okay this is what vasudha says it's relative so hari says basically it depends i think if the size is fixed then it's not big data it becomes bit difficult for the system admin uh like me to manage data more than 1 terabyte because it is not enough for analysis and make a prediction okay so so we 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 again have a very uh, great set of answers so we have uh, so we have a very bright set of um, people who are attending the session yes so um, okay let's move ahead and answer uh, the question and uh, i i've got a lot lots of good reasons already in the answers okay so is one petabyte big data yes definitely it is one it is uh, big data why because of the mo because most of the existing systems can't handle it so when we started the session we and when we answered what is big data we said big data is data of very big size which you cannot process or which you cannot store using your usual hardware right for which you need um distributed computing so yes one petabyte is definitely not something that you can store in your usual computers or one petabyte is definitely not something that you can process on your computer so one petabyte by virtue of the size yes it becomes big data so um, we at no big data basically did an uh, did a experiment where we uh, tried reading 1 terabyte data from a hard disk and it takes close to 5.8 hours suppose you have to read 1 petabyte of data uh, serially from a uh, from a storage it it can take um, 5.8 into 1000 so close to 6000 hours yes um so um so one petabyte is definitely big data because if reading one terabyte of data takes close to 5.8 hours reading one petabyte of data will take much more, more much much more than that and think about it the the uh, the common hard disks external hard drives that you get these days is 1 terabyte or 2 terabytes so therefore to store one petabyte you definitely need you know much much more hardware and much much more processing and computing capabilities uh, so vasudha is asking but cannot it be stored in a server yes vasudha definitely it can be stored on a server but that is what makes it big data right because you're not able to store it on your machine so hence it becomes big data okay uh, so how much time does it take to read 1 terabyte like i just answered we did this small experiment in no big data and it takes close to 6 hours to read 1 terabyte of data okay ramesh uh, is asking so scale out is viable and not scale up but how do you remove the interdependency data interpretations uh, ramesh can you rephrase your question for me as well as for others i am not i don't think i got your question very clearly okay so while ramesh is uh, asking his question again rephrasing his question we will try and answer why big data so uh, until um, until now we have answered 
what is big data? Now let's try and answer why big data. Like why did big data become a problem or why is big data becoming a buzzword? Why, you know, why is everybody talking about big data? So like this slide shows, data, data essentially is stored in two formats, analog storage or it's stored in two uh, storage systems. It could be analog storage or digital storage. Um, example of analog storage is paper, film, audio tapes, vinyls, etc. And like, like all of us know, the analog storage did not expand exponentially. You know, it kept on, it, it just stayed, it just stayed constant. So analog storage did not expand too much. Whereas digital storage, uh, example of digital storage being flash drives, uh, uh, CD-ROMs and, you know, CDs, flash drives and hard disks, RAMs, etc. Uh, they, they are basically, you know, the use of these digital storage is increasing with every passing day. So, um, at the beginning of 2002, essentially what happened was, that digital storage started growing exponentially lots and so these devices started becoming cheaper and uh, you know uh, more um, more available more cheaper and by virtue of that the digital storage expanded and since the digital storage expanded lots of data basically started getting accumulated started getting stored and started getting generated and hence since we we started having so much data you know, um, at our disposal that we wanted, that big data started becoming a problem. Like, you know, big data came into being and people wanted to analyze this huge amount of data that, that was getting collected through these devices, etc. So this is, this is essentially why big data came into picture. Okay, let's look at the questions. So basically what I'll do is when I move to a slide, I'll first explain everything that's there in the slide. Meanwhile, uh, you people can post your questions and once I'm done with the slide, I'll look at the questions and answer the questions. Okay, so uh, world's 90% data has been generated in last two years, hence big data. Yes, Mujahid has a very, very good point. He says that the 90% of the data that's that's generated over, over time has been actually generated in just the last two years which shows that you know devices are growing and connectivity is growing and you know lots of data is being generated and we want to analyze this data great digitalization overcame the latency issues with analog devices and analog functions when we split process for scale out we need results in such a way that the result of okay so ramesh is uh, asking his question again when we split process for scale out we need results in such a way that the result of one process does not okay so he's saying that when we split process um okay so basically when we have a very big problem at hand and then we are and then when we divide this problem into multiple sub problems and try to solve each of these sub problems in parallel uh, how can we ensure that the uh, result of one process does not affect the outcome of the does not affect the output of the uh, output of another process? So, uh, Ramesh, this is a very very good question, and this is what essentially Hadoop is trying to solve. So, when we, uh, you know, um, when we discuss in detail about Hadoop's architecture, we're actually going to discuss how a, a huge problem is divided into multiple sub problems, and how these sub problems are then computed independent of each other and the outcome of each of these sub problems is then is then combined to give you the final final result so we will discuss this much much more in detail when we discuss the hadoop's architecture let me take 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 up this question um, at a later point in time okay so um, we answered uh, we answered why big data let's let's look at why is it important now? So, um, like I said, that devices have become much, much cheaper. The, the smartphones that we carry these days have become much cheaper, much faster, and 
and smaller and so the devices have become cheaper much more affordable each one of us is now carrying a smartphone we log on to facebook we log on to twitter we are we are connected through so many social networking sites and we and hence we tend to generate a lot of data connectivity is also one one important aspect Con- connectivity basically the internet has become so fast and you know so accessible with 2g 3g 4g wifi a broadband etc uh, we are getting much much more connected and with the devices becoming cheaper more more and more data is getting generated and hence it is becoming important now for us to analyze this data to basically use this data at our disposal to derive insights out of it and and make meaningful and make use of this data correct so ansar says internet of things correct so basically you know we are getting much much more connected through these devices and connectivity improving and hence we are generating so devices multiplied by the connectivity we are generating much much more data and now we want to analyze this data we want to do something with this do something meaningful with this data okay so here is a quick question it's a very very simple question which components impact the speed of computing um, is it a cpu b memory c memory read speed disk speed disk size network speed or all of the above okay okay great so most of us think it's all of the above all of these components basically impact the speed of computing great great so g is the answer yes definitely all of these components impact the speed of computing we will we will discuss this uh, with a quick example so assume uh, that you have uh, just created your own website and lots of people are coming and you know visiting your website and basically do so um consider a e-commerce website that you've just launched lots of people are coming on your website and buying things so basically orders flow into your system and you have to process these orders so if you have a very fast enough cpu a very fast enough processor you will be able to basically uh, process these orders that come into your system fast so cpu comes into picture here right so cpu is one of the components that is therefore responsible for computing however think of it this way if if you know you you start getting millions of orders like say flipkart or amazon for instance one cpu might not suffice and then cpu becomes the bottleneck you need multiple multiple processors you need better machines and you need better machines to basically process all of this all of these orders so okay so now we see that cpu um, could have become the bottleneck and we can increase this we can increase the number of processors that we had that we have to process the large number of orders that we are getting then second thing is ram so uh, basically what is ram ram is random access memory the data stored in the memory needs to be accessed and stuff so ram could become the bottleneck as well because you know so much so many orders are coming they will definitely not just uh, they cannot reside in memory because usually the ram sizes are much smaller compared to disk sizes so the ram becomes a bottleneck so you have to move to disk uh, you have to start storing these orders on on disk and then uh, you have to so basically the read and the write uh, speed of the disk starts you know making a difference now since you're getting so many millions of orders probably just one disk will not be you know um, enough to store your data so you will have to split your data into multiple disks now these disks can reside over over different machines and to connect these machines you will now need network so you will need network to connect your web server to connect your web server to your 
database where actually the data resides and for the data to replicate and stuff you will again need network so the network becomes a bottleneck here so all of these four uh, components cpu ram disk and network they together work in conjunction to basically impact the computing speed so um, so are we all clear about you know how um, all of these components basically impact computing uh, do you have any questions here okay great so we understand that you know so with the with the help of this example we we explained how you know one component after the other can start becoming the bottleneck and how we'll have to resolve each of these each of these problems to basically achieve a better computing okay so yeah so basically this slide says that at least one of these could become the bottleneck and then you will have to solve that to achieve better computing okay um so um we'll continue for for, for 5 10 more minutes and then we'll take a break and then we'll come back okay so um i saw uh, a couple of questions at the beginning of the session where uh, you guys wanted to understand about use cases where hadoop is getting used what are the applications of big data and stuff so um big data has a lot of customers right from e-commerce companies to telecommunications etc so i uh, so big data essentially has a lot of customers uh, in in e-commerce there is a very very um, you know popular problem which is called recommendations that is one of the one of the very good examples or one of the very good use cases where big data essentially comes into picture so let's discuss what recommendations essentially is and why is it a big data problem okay so uh, this uh, slide is basically just shows screenshots from amazon.com so do we all know uh, what uh, recommendation systems are can can some of you uh, quickly explain about recommendation systems yes vasudha search engines also involve a lot of big is also a big data problem because there is so much data in the world and you have to search over that data it is definitely a big data problem okay great so uh, okay great great set of answers here uh, good good answers so uh, basically use your history to prompt what you might want to buy this is what ramesh says recommend something related to the user based on your based on our search history we are giving recommendations on the stuff we might like some of the products online across by end users the system by itself logically suggests better options for the users yeah great great answers so yes recommendations are essentially suggestions so when you go and buy, purchase an item from an e-commerce company it shows you something like customers who bought this item also bought this item so basically it it shows it basically shows that you know customers for instance who bought mobile phones also bought mobile covers for example or uh, customers who bought um, a sports uh, a badminton racket also bought um, a sport shoes so basically it gives you recommendations like this where how does it how does it basically help obviously when you are going and buying a mobile phone you might want to buy a screen guard or you might want to buy a mobile phone cover as well so these these recommendations uh, help increase sales there is there is another uh, set of recommendations where uh, um, where it says that you know when so 
when you are buying for instance when you buying a dress it says it says that you know you can you can basically buy a bag along with it or buy a certain piece of jewelry along with it and stuff so yeah correct correct uh, so okay so so all of us understand what recommendation essentially is recommendation is basically a suggestion based on based on what you are trying what you are buying currently the website suggests what else would you like to buy or what are what are the chances you know it, it will give you a set of items that that you could buy you know basically there is a high probability of you buying those items and hence it shows you those items correct akushal that's a very very good example in fact my next uh, slide also has that so this is a screenshot from netflix so it it basically recommends for instance if you are used to buying if you are used to watching a uh, thriller genre for instance when when you are trying to buy a movie or when you are viewing a movie from thriller genre it will suggest you other movies which fall into the same category so imdb or netflix they also suggest you movies based on your uh, searching pattern or buying pattern viewing pattern etc so why is it why is it a big data problem to to basically get recommendations like these that customers who bought this also bought this you have to collect a lot of data from a lot of users over a given the over a given period of time and then essentially understand and find patterns out of it so you have to let your data answer that customers who usually buy a mobile phone also land up buying a screen cover or also uh, land up buying the screen guard etc and hence we should be showing on the on the product page of a mobile phone we should also be showing these other items where wherein there is a high probability of the user buying those items okay so why is it a big data problem okay yeah so vipin says that the system by itself needs to generate and keep these information of the end users get these suggestions for the next time yes so over a period of time you basically start collecting this data in this format so you say user id movie id and the rating so for instance kumar is the user id he he and he has rated the movie matrix with four rating uh, kumar has also given a rating of 3.5 to icage so you basically start collecting data in this format so as and when you the users are visiting your website you start collecting the data you that is totally unstructured data you have to first convert it into a structured data in this format and then you feed into a feed it into uh, a um a system called mahot uh, which is basically again a, a system that enables you to process big data we will discuss about mahot in much more details in the uh, in the coming sessions and mahot what mahot essentially does is it will give you the user id the movie id and the rating that you might want to give that you would have given to the movie so basically it says that the user id giri would have could have given the movie matrix a rating of 4.5 and based on this it essentially gives the recommendation so you were getting a lot of unstructured data when the users were visiting your website and you first constructed the data in this format in the table on the left side uh, in the format of user id movie id rating then you feed it into a system called mahot and mahot gives you the the output you gives you the output in this format and you use this to show the uh, users basically the recommendation so you use the product history you use the order history order history you you see the customers buying pattern and a lot of these things product history as in you know when someone someone bought this they also landed up buying these products or a user is for instance you know you might want to capture data like um the gender and uh, the gender the the zip code the geospatial location and stuff to rec to give better recommendations okay so neha has a question how is this not structured data 
Neha, this is definitely structured data, but the you have the input, the basically the source of this data was unstructured when the, when a user was visiting your website, you know, you were getting a lot of these data and then you constructed this structured data out of it. So this is just one example. You might want to, you know, capture data like the gender or uh, the the location, the country from where the, you know, from where the user is visiting. So for instance, if the user is visiting from India, you might want to recommend him Hindi movies as well. Or if he is visiting from a certain certain part of India, you might want to recommend him movies in his own um, in in the language of that location. So that is not uh, structured data. You might you would have captured that data through cookies or you know through through various other means, and that the the source of the data might not be structured. But yes, to feed it into Mahat, you basically capture data from multiple places and you've converted it into a, a structured format and then you fed it into Mahat. Okay, so Sridhar is asking how matrix is recommended to Giri. Okay, uh, so uh, Sridhar, this is basically a very sample, uh, you know, it's just a sample, it's just an example which shows you how, in what format the data should be fed to Mahat. But yeah, uh, suppose Giri had also liked the movie Ice Age and uh, and someone else also would have liked the movie Ice Age as well as the movie Matrix and there are multiple users who have liked movie Ice Age as well as movie Matrix. So when the user Giri likes Ice Age, we see that there are multiple users who have liked the movie Ice Age and like the movie Matrix and hence you recommend Matrix to the user Giri as well. Okay, uh, how to prevent cross influencing data recursion like friends data affecting me and me influencing my friends. Okay, so Ramesh, why would you want this to get prevented like this is essentially what happens in recommendation systems. Uh, the, the data, the data and the buying patterns, etc. basically affect, you know, other users. Yes, it is. It is machine learning. Mahat is basically a set of algorithms, a set of machine learning algorithms. Uh, correct. Forever, uh, Ramesh, I'm sorry, but you can, uh, but uh, can you rephrase your question? I am not sure I got your question correctly. Okay, uh, so we discussed about recommendation systems. Sentiment analysis is another use case. It's a, an, another, another very common use case. Where is sentiment analysis essentially used? Sentiment analysis is used, um, uh, for instance, you know, you've just launched a brand or uh, assume, think of it like this. There are two, you know, burger chains. There is KFC and there is McDonald's. And both of them have launched, you know, a different variety of burgers. And you see a lot of tweets around this. A lot of tweets, you know, saying that the burger from KFC, the new burger from KFC is good, is bad. You know, it's it's expensive. It's not expensive. It's cheap and stuff. So basically, you analyze these tweets for sentiments. You see whether a given particular, a, a, a given tweet is conveying a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment and this gives you an understanding about how a brand is doing or about how a particular product from a brand is doing. So sentiment analysis also becomes a big data problem. Um, these, uh, these data where you might want to analyze uh, it for sentiment could be, you know, it could be collected from various sources, from Facebook, uh, from Facebook posts, uh, from Twitter, and from various other sources. Okay, uh, so Hari is asking, so basically semantic analysis. No, Hari, this is different from uh, semantic analysis. This is sentiment analysis. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, for example, if a tweet says, I love the burger from, from I love the new burger from KFC. It, it is a, 
it's conveying a good sentiment it's conveying a positive sentiment whereas um the new burger from kfc did not live up to my expectations it is conveying a negative sentiment so this is sentiment analysis where you try and understand the mood of the mood of the data the mood of the tweet okay yes so vipin has a good point um we have these feedback and the review sections on on and uh, in the e-commerce websites where users give their feedback so based and their ratings so based on the ratings and the feedbacks we can do sentiment analysis on the feedbacks and figure out whether a given product is doing well or it's not doing well so this basically helps the brands so here we saw two very common use cases of big data uh, one being uh, recommendation systems very commonly used in uh, e-commerce websites and uh, sentiment analysis where which the product which the brands use to understand how their how their newly launched product is doing so are we all clear uh, with use cases of big data and how big data you know comes into play in the regular day to day computations and operations uh feel free to ask any questions that you have i'm getting some really really good set of questions so yeah and i'm i'm and it's it's nice that you know all of you are so attentive when you're asking questions okay so vipin has this very brilliant question where it he, he says that if he uh, adds a product into the into his wish list or into his shortlisted items on flipkart or amazon and uh, the next time when he visits facebook or some other website it shows up as ads yeah so this is also a big data problem basically uh, you know these websites uh, they basically track your usage uh, they 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 track your behavior on the internet they they see you know which websites do you visit often so if if for instance uh you visit a website you visit a lot of sports related website you will start seeing you know a lot of ads related to sports you will see a lot of ads from flipkart selling you sports related items and stuff this is definitely a big data problem it's it's a very very good use case of big data where these websites they they track the users behavior through multiple means and then they use this behavior of the user to to sh show ads to show relevant ads to the user so google adwords is one such thing so google basically you know keeps track of your behavior on the internet and then uses this um behavior of yours to essentially show you better ads with a better um with a better conversion rate yes these are all big data problems because user base is very huge because a lot of data is getting generated and it is unstructured data so you have to you know uh, process this data to analyze it and so on okay so uh, we already um, went over um, some big data uh, use cases and a couple of big data customers could be you know government uses big data for fraud detection for cyber security and then there are healthcare systems which use uh, big data for you know information exchange and for uh, to see if a drug is performing well and uh, so all of there are there are lots of big data customers so i'll quickly give you an example of how big data comes into play in healthcare so to give you a better understanding so assume so this is what a couple of hospitals in singapore actually recently did what they started doing was they started analyzing how a particular person with a particular disease responds responds to a particular type of treatment so a person with diabetes how does he respond to a particular type of treatment a particular with certain symptoms how how does he respond to a type of treatment and then they kept uh, they kept collecting this data over a longer period of time and they kept analyzing these this data for meaningful patterns so that when a new 
patient comes in they can see his his or her symptoms and using that and the previous history they can they can you know quickly recommend they can quickly administer a particular drug to the person or administer a treatment to the person so this is how big data comes into picture in healthcare okay uh, so this slide essentially shows a lot of big data uh, customers like a lot of companies who use big data name a company and yeah reach correct so this is the slide and after this we'll take a break so um, name a company and it uses big data facebook yahoo linkedin you know ebay uh, all these e-commerce website all these search websites etc etc all of them they basically are big data customers so uh, let's take a break uh, here since we started a little late apologies for that we might uh, we might you know um, extend a little bit above we will we'll try to wrap it up by 10 let's take a break for 5 minutes please please keep uh, posting your questions and i'll come back after the break and answer your questions uh, vipin i'll answer your question as well about what is cubol into uh, let's let's quickly take a break for 5 uh, uh, for 10 minutes and come back exactly at uh, 9:30 let's come back at 9:30 sounds good uh meanwhile please uh, post your questions and we'll come back by 9:30 okay great
okay uh, so um, great um, i know it was a short break apologies for that since we started a little late okay uh, let me quickly answer the questions so vipin uh, is asking what is cubol into okay so vipin uh, cubol is basically a big data analytics platform so um, you know there are a lot of these users who have huge amounts of data that they want to process but basically it requires a lot of infrastructure it, re it requires a lot of servers it requires hadoop clusters to be set up or if you're using other big data technologies like uh, you know spark or hive or pig you have to basically you know manage all of these infrastructures so what essentially we do at cubol is we basically enable the entire infrastructure we give the in infrastructure out of the box so the user can completely just you know focus on the data and the questions or the insights he wants to derive of the data he need not bother or he need not take care about the infrastructure at all he can just come on to cubol he can say that this is my data and this is the query and this is the questions that i want to ask my data and you can just start running these queries or the hadoop jobs etc so we basically provide the entire infrastructure so did i answer your question dipin okay great uh, so vasudha is asking what are the responsibilities of a hadoop architect and how do you become one so vasudha uh, basically a hadoop architect is you know uh, responsible for like i said is responsible for setting up the hadoop clusters or uh, you know administrative responsibilities uh, administrative responsibilities like um, managing the clusters and you know deciding you know uh, what sort of workloads what big a cluster size would you need will you need a 100 node cluster or will you will a 1000 node cluster do or you know uh, things like this this is what uh, typically a hadoop architect is responsible for uh, you know writing the map reduce uh, uh, programs and stuff and how do you become one It, it it just you know gradually comes over time you can start playing around around with hadoop now that you're taking this course you'll learn about the architecture we will in fact have you know the entire cluster set up so that you can have a hands on experience dealing with the cluster we will do projects and stuff so it will give you basically end to end understanding a end to end exposure of how to handle the entire of the entire hadoop ecosystem and that should essentially help you you know go forward and you know basically become a hadoop architect going forward okay uh shridhar has a question of how hadoop handles continuous stream of data shridhar actually hadoop is not responsible for handling uh, stream of data hadoop is more of a batch processing system however there are other big data technologies which do handle stream of data for example apache storm which is a very recent um, you know it's a recent technology so there are other other technologies which handle stream of data hadoop is primarily responsible for batch processing and how do they handle stream of data um, in very simple terms think of it like you know there is a queue uh, sitting in between uh, the consumer and the producer so when you're producing the data you keep pushing it into into the queue and the consumer is essentially the big data system which pulls up uh, the data uh, the data that you push into the queue and tries to process it so this is how stream processing is in, is essentially done so shridhar did i answer your question so consumer is storm here yes consumer is storm producer could be you know uh, for example tweets that uh, continuously come on twitter so that is the producer and we can we can feed it into storm or we can feed it into any other big data system by by means of a queue in i am explaining it in very simple terms so think of it like you have a queue and uh, you know uh, the big data system basically pulls up this uh, thing from the queue and processes it 
okay uh, so uh, shishir is asking can you please tell what is clear case and how it is integrated with hadoop and its applications um shishir i am not very uh, i am myself not very clear about you know uh, this about what actually clear case is but we we you know we we'll we can read more about it and we'll definitely write back to you about what clear case is or you know we can discuss about it in the next session i apologies for that but uh, i am myself not very clear about this uh okay uh, so kushal uh, although he has left he is he is asked do you need do you have knowledge of statistics for big data okay he is i think he is asking do you need knowledge of statistics statistics for big data understanding not really but yeah having statistical understanding really helps so you know it like mathematics helps yes definitely having statistical understanding helps clear cases okay 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 so i think clear case is a software configuration management tool okay okay so uh, vasuda r is just another language you know um, python like python is a language java is a language r is a language you can basically write your big data programs or your big data problems in terms of python in terms of r in terms of um, java in terms of you know other other query languages that we will talk about in in this session in fact so r basically helps you to write you know you can you can express your big data uh, problems in in using the language r but it is not something related with statistics i am sorry what is not related with statistics okay uh, yeah that is okay basically think of it like this so uh, when we discuss about hadoop uh, we will see how hadoop basically boils down to writing map reduce jobs you have to write map tasks and you have to write reduce tasks so you can express this uh, task you can express this uh, in terms of you know um, various languages okay yeah so i agree with pipin let's just quickly go over the slides and then if we have time left we we'll, we can um, we'll answer more questions i can probably stretch a little more and uh, some of you who want to answer the questions can stay back and uh, ask you know questions okay okay so let's discuss about um uh, 11 Okay uh, thanks George it was nice having you on uh, no big data looking forward to having you back okay let's discuss about the common myths about big data and this will basically answer a lot of questions um, a lot of questions that you that you people want to ask so one of the very uh, common myths with big data is big data always means you know data above terabytes so this is not really true like we discussed earlier that uh, uh, for instance if you have you know uh, maps data which is much much lesser in size but it since it is so complex it becomes a big data problem so big data it does not have to be you know data of very big size it does not have to always be in terabytes or you know petabytes if the data is of smaller size but it is very complex you still need multiple processors and you know uh, parallel computing etc distributed computing so big data doesn't doesn't always mean data above terabytes it is always about social media it doesn't apply to me no this is incorrect we've already discussed this at length in the previous slides it is not always about social media social media is one of the biggest consumers and producers of big data but big data applies to all of us big data will replace ewd enterprise data warehouse no uh, big data is not here to replace uh, data warehouses if transactions and consistency is what you want then you have to go with data warehouses but if you, if scalability availability reliability is more important to you 
then you choose big data. So big data is not here to replace enterprise data warehouses. Big data is just a buzzword. It has no practical applications. We've already, you know, uh, spoken about it, spoken about it. It is not a buzzword. In fact, we, we looked at a couple of uh, very, very important use cases and very practical applications that you see everywhere. You, you purchase items from e-commerce websites and you see recommendations every day. And that's a big data problem. So it has practical applications. Big data is a new concept. No, big data is not a new concept. It is, in fact, a very old concept. Maybe the, since the term has been coined recently, it feels like a new concept. Big data will be the future. No, big data is already the present. This is, this is the age of big data, you know, lots and lots of data being generated because of the devices and better connectivity. So big data has already come into play. Big data is expensive. No, this is one, one of the biggest myths that people have with big data. In fact, big data is really, really cheap. Like the software and the technology as such is very cheap. Why and how? Because most of these technologies are open source. You know, uh, support is so readily available for these technologies. And, you know, uh, you can download these softwares and you can start running them. So big data is not expensive. It is only for data scientists or is magic. No, big data is not for data. It's not only for data scientists. People belonging to any uh, any profession, you know, any profession might need, you know, insights out of the, out of the data. And in some or the other way, they need to analyze big data. It is not, you know, confined to data scientists. We have not, we don't have enough hardware. Okay, so we have enough hardware, we don't need any more. Actually, this is also a myth. You might feel that you have enough hardware, but if you start using your hardware in, in a much more efficient way, you will in fact realize that you might not have needed that much hardware at all. So that is another common myth with big data. We will build it when we need it. If, if this is a myth that people, if this is something that people follow, they will in fact not be able to build it when they need it. Because when you build it, you need a lot of data that you want to analyze over a period of time. So, so basically you will have to start collecting this data even if you want to build the engine later, even if you want to process the data later, you will still have to start collecting the data, you know, very soon. So the data gets accumulated and then you can start processing your data. Big data is about Hadoop. No, big data is not about Hadoop only. It, big data, there are a lot of other big data technologies except, uh, apart from Hadoop. Hadoop is obviously one of the most uh, popular technologies. Okay, so uh, I'll quickly look at the questions. And meanwhile, if you have any questions about this particular slide deck, you can start posting those questions. Can people from non-technical background pursue to understand this further and choose to go on in this particular field or you need to have technical knowledge or background? So um, this is Neha's question and I think it is a, it is a very, very nice question. Uh, okay. Um, so Neha, um, you will need, if you actually want to, you know, practically use uh, these technologies, like if you want to work on Hadoop, you will need some amount of um, some basic uh, technical knowledge, like you will need, if you can write, you know, basic code, like constructs, like if you understand for loops, while loops, some basic programming constructs, and if you understand some basic uh, database technologies and SQL, etc. Uh, you you will ha need to have some amount of technical knowledge to practically use Hadoop, but to understand the use cases and etc., you obviously don't need technical knowledge. You just need you just need to understand how you can use your data better. Okay, uh, Neha, uh, feel free to ask further questions if I have not clearly answered your uh, this question. I believe even meteorological and metallurgical studies needs technology like big data. This is Vipin's question. Yes, yes, this this. In fact, yeah, you're, you're correct. Meteorological studies do need uh, big data. So 
it's again you know you collect a lot of data over a period of time and then you want to analyze the data you want to understand patterns about the data etc metallurgy so you um I'm not an expert in that, but yeah, I can relate it to big data some, you know, in a way. So for instance, you can understand that a particular geographical location has a particular metal in abundance or has a particular mineral in abundance, etc. So uh, you you definitely need big data technologies in, in metallurgy, in meteorology, etc. to understand, you know, patterns and derive insights out of your data. Amazon AWS is for number 11. Big data is about Hadoop. Uh, Tarumal, can you re rephrase your question? I did not ask your, I, I didn't, did not get your question. Amazon AWS is for uh, number 11. Number 11 says big data is about Hadoop. So I'll quickly tell you Amazon AWS is, okay, uh, AWS is not essentially a big data example. AWS is basically, um, you can, AWS is basically a service from Amazon wherein Amazon gives you virtual machines, wherein Amazon gives you machines to do anything. You can run your website on those machines. You can, you know, install anything on those machines or you can use those machines for your big data technologies to run your big data technologies as well. If technical BG is required, where to start from? Okay, if technical background is required, where to start from? Okay, Vignesh, uh, yeah, so if technical background, you you can start from some basic uh, programming and some basic database knowledge. Uh, this, I think this, this could be the starting step. You can, you know, you can try writing some basic, uh, basic programs, uh, do, try and do some basic processing, do some sort, sorting algorithms, do some searching algorithms and stuff. So that, you know, this gives you a sense that if you want to sort, say, 10 numbers, how do you do it? Now, if you want to sort 1000 numbers, how do you do it? And so on. So, um, yeah, this is, I think, how you can start. Which language to start? Any language of your uh, choice, you know, whichever language you're comfortable with. You can start with Java, you can start with C, you can start with C++, etc. Uh, okay, the... Reason I said it is because groups like ISRO and all, they take graphs and ge geographical pictures which need a lot of digital space to store. Yes, yes, Vipin, you're correct. So you, uh, institutions like ISRO and NASA, etc., they basically capture a lot of, they basically capture a lot of data over a, you know, over a period of time and, uh, then, you definitely need a lot of space to store this data and then you need processing capabilities to derive insights out of this data. So this definitely becomes a big data problem. Okay, uh, let's move ahead. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, apologies for that, Ina. Let's, uh, let's uh, complete with the slides and then we can have, we can start answering the questions. Okay, salary trends. So this basically, uh, this slide basically sh shows uh, how the salaries uh, for uh, people with uh, Hadoop expertise or you know uh, expertise around other big data technologies, how how the salaries are gradually increasing for these expertise and how these expertise is more and more you know in demand and it's needed. Uh, so this basically talks about salary trends in the market. Um, we all know that, you know, um, big data expertise or expertise around Hadoop or around these big data technologies is a lot in demand these days. Okay, so we've already taken the break. So uh, let's let's move ahead. Okay, so we'll talk, we'll quickly talk about some of the, uh, some of the big data solutions. Like all of you know, Apache Hadoop is one of the big data solutions. Then there is Apache Spark, there is Cassandra, there is MongoDB, there is Google Compute Engine, etc. So, um, all of these are basically, you know, uh, big data technologies which are reliable, scalable, they are fast. Uh, so I'll just quickly give you a very um, quick introduction into these technologies. So Spark is basically, uh, a Spark is a processing engine. Uh, it helps you to process large amounts of data. So it's a large scale processing engine. Uh, Spark is faster than Hadoop. It, it is when when the data is processed in memory, it can be 100 times faster than Hadoop. 
and um, so again uh, and spark does most of the processing in memory so uh, spark is one of the big data technologies cassandra is uh, a no sql database what do we understand by uh, Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, what do we understand by NoSQL? NoSQL is not only SQL, so basically it is much much more than SQL. So Cassandra is basically a a, a column columnar oriented database. So basically, we will talk about these technologies much much in detail in the coming sessions. Yeah. So okay, I'll I'll take up the questions uh, at the end. Once I'm done with the slides, MongoDB is again another NoSQL uh, solution. It is a document-oriented database. Google Compute Engine, uh, Google, you know, provides you a lot of the lot of big data technologies. You can bring up Hadoop clusters on Google Cloud and stuff. So um, Google Compute Engine is another big data technologies. Okay. Uh, so uh, we will talk about Hadoop and. Uh, let's quickly answer what is hadoop and this will in turn answer a lot of other questions so what is hadoop hadoop was basically hadoop is basically a big data technology that was created by doug cutting and mike caffarella from yahoo so basically uh, they were actually trying to build a search engine uh, called nutch and uh, Um, they had and because they were building a search engine they had to process a lot of data they had to deal with a lot of data around the same time google came up with uh, a couple of papers uh, which was um, google file system google map reduce and google big table so uh, doc cutting and um, uh, they basically built the entire hadoop platform around these three papers so google file system essentially maps to the hadoop distributed file system uh google map reduce uh, maps to the hadoop map reduce and google big table maps to edge case okay so neha has this question uh about the elephant picture basically it's, it's nothing uh, the toy elephant of the founder uh, so basically sorry uh, uh the founder had a kid uh, has a kid who had a toy elephant which was named hadoop and he just picked up the name from there from the toy elephant his kids uh, toy okay so that that is how the picture comes uh, the elephant comes okay uh, hadoop is open source um, so it is hadoop is uh, licensed uh, under apache and apache is one of the most um, uh most liberal licenses uh, so you know you can download hadoop you can compile hadoop you can run hadoop on your clusters all of this is open source and apache is, is a very very liberal license okay and uh, hadoop is one of the mo most pa uh, powerful popular uh, and the supported big data technologies uh, popular you already know all of you know about hadoop why is it one of the most supported uh, technologies since it is open source and since apache is such a liberal license uh, hadoop you know lot of people started using hadoop quickly they started training and uh, training in hadoop and uh, Uh, they started using hadoop uh, in their you know day to day workloads and stuff and and gradually the community around hadoop started building up so you know a, a lot of support system the forums and a lot of the entire hadoop community started building up because of the popularity and the fact that hadoop is open source uh, hadoop is definitely a framework to handle big data uh hadoop is reliable scalable and distributed computing why is it reliable consider that you store or store huge amounts of data in your hadoop system if some of this data gets lost because of some reason because of power failure or because of some other reason hadoop stores backup of this data so by virtue of this hadoop becomes a reliable system hadoop is a scalable system so uh, as assume that you have a 100 node cluster running where you are running your workloads we will definitely explain much more about you know clusters etc in the coming sessions but assume that you have a 100 node uh, cluster um, where 100 machines are running in conjunction and they are running a hadoop workload and you realize that you know 100 machines are not sufficing then you start adding you can add more machines to this cluster and hence hadoop is scalable 
you don't have to you know just restrict yourself to the cluster size that you started up with you can increase it while you're running your workloads hence hadoop is scalable hadoop is written in java so why was java chosen basically because of the platform portability and you know uh it is it is much more uh, easy to run much more easy to bring up jvms and run you know java processes etc so so java was the chosen language for hadoop uh, i will take up all the questions once i'm done with the slides so uh, keep posting your questions okay um okay so th this is this slide basically uh, explains uh, okay so we just have uh, two three more slides so this slide basically explains about the hadoop ecosystem about the various components that hadoop ecosystem has so one of the most important components is the hadoop distributed file system hdfs this is where essentially the data is stored so the data that you want to process you will store it on in hdfs the distributed file system on top of hdfs uh, there is a there is uh, something called yarn yarn is a cluster management system so basically uh, we have mentioned the keyword cluster a couple of times so yarn is essentially responsible for managing the hadoop clusters so it's a cluster management tool map reduce spark etc they sit on top of yarn so uh, basically these are processing engines uh, that that connect to hdfs that read the data from hdfs via yarn so map reduce is a um, uh you know a way of programming and spark is a processing engine and there are a couple of others like these hbase is a no sql data store hbase stands for hadoop data hadoop database it's a no sql data store and uh, the data in hbase is stored in columnar uh, okay so the data is stored in hbase in um, columnar format and uh, we will discuss hbase in much more depth in the coming uh, sessions uh, so there are a couple of languages uh, like hive pig latin etc uh, that you can write so basically uh, think about it this way map so basically when you want to run a hadoop workload you you essentially write map reduce jobs however writing map reduce jobs might not be you know easy every time and since most of us are comfortable writing you know sql so uh, and we we are we are, we are generally comfortable writing sql so hive pig etc are basically technologies that that let you write map reduce jobs uh, quickly and in a you know in a simple way so basically hive is a sort of a query language so you can uh, write your map reduce job in a query in a sql like format uh, hadoop in turn will convert your uh, hive in turn will convert your uh, sql statement into map reduce jobs and run them on hadoop so pig is another such language which is a little more powerful than hive mohot is something that we've already discussed is a it's a machine learning like machine learn it's a it's a set of machine learning algorithms uh what is apache flume so the the bottom part of the slide shows apache flume and apache scoop so we discussed about data and we know that the data that we want to process we want to store it in hdfs but how do we how do we push the data into hdfs how do we store the data into hdfs because the data can be in you know multiple other systems in multiple um so the data could be in uh, multiple uh other systems like it could uh, so if it's unstructured data it could be your logs it could be audios videos uh all of those and if it is structured data it could lie lie in your my in your in your oracle databases in your mysql databases etc so flume and scoop are two technologies uh that help you port uh the data from these data sources into hdfs so you use apache flume to port to bring in unstructured data like logs etc into hdfs scoop is another uh, technology which you use to uh, 
pull data from uh, other uh, databases other um, relational databases into hdfs so um, uzi is uh, a component uh, uzi is basically a workflow management system so for instance if you want to write a recommendation system like we discussed you will have to first pull in the data from the various data sources organize them into the tables into a format that mohit understands and then you might want to run this uh, recommendation uh, basically the entire workflow that you have written every day so you might want to schedule it every day so uzi basically helps you to write this entire workflow and do the scheduling uh, also uh, there uh, there are um, you can write um, there are a lot of clis a uh, lot of clients you can write you know hadoop uh, you can write map reduce uh, uh, map reduce jobs in terms of uh, in, in in java you can write them in python you can write them in other languages as well so this is essentially the entire hadoop ecosystem we will discuss uh, each of them in much more in detail we'll we'll solve problems and we'll uh, we'll have hands on experience on uh, clusters on the cloud um, in the in the following sessions please feel free to ask questions okay uh, uh at the introduction um uh, we already discussed what is cloud labs so cloud labs is basically something that we have set up for you where you get a real life experience uh, uh, end to end experience about how to manage your uh, uh, clusters how to manage hadoop clusters it has it already has all the required tools deployed so uh, people uh, some of you have already signed up for the full course you can log on to no big data and under my courses under sessions 1 you will see instructions on how to log on to cloud labs and how you know you can play around with it uh, i'll just uh, some of you have already like have already enrolled for the, for the program you can take up the assignment there is a very small quiz under sessions 1 that is something that you can take up um some of the questions in the quiz are around uh, hdfs or yarn so you can skip those questions you can take the question you can take the quiz as many number of times as you want so this is this is all uh, from the uh, from today's session i will uh, since we are already you know post time i'll quickly start answering uh, the questions that uh, you guys have why to use hadoop but not spark spark is faster than hadoop correct yes yes rajat spark is faster than hadoop uh, but you know um, hadoop is a is a entire hadoop basically is a full system so hadoop gives you the capability to store the data as well as to process the data whereas spark is only for processing there is no storage layer in spark uh, in hadoop you can store the data in uh, you can store the data in hdfs and uh, you can store the data in hdfs so um, okay uh so that is why some people uh, want to use hadoop over spark also spark is uh, is usually done uh, more for you know streaming kind of data so where a continuous stream of data is flowing whereas hadoop is more of batch processing where you already have some data collected say until yesterday you have collected some data and you want to process that data so that is what uh, uh, that is where hadoop is a better uh, technology over spark okay so uh, just a second um like in rdbms rdbms does big data tools give facility to transfer from one big data tool to another yes uh, apache scoop uh, is one such uh, technology so basically you can transfer data from one uh, from your oracle database to hdfs or and you can transfer it back from hdfs to your oracle database so apache scoop is one such technology 
how is hadoop and big data related to analytics and its tools like sas or is it different hadoop and big data uh, so big data is essentially data of very huge size but you the moment you want to analyze your data to derive insights out of it to derive some patterns out of it to understand behavior etc it becomes big data analytics that is when you are analyzing the data and that is what what is called as big data analytics um so uh, and so by sas do you mean uh, uh vignesh can you explain what you exactly mean by sas uh, so like do you mean you know software as a service or what do you mean by it i wonder what made someone who is into big data hadoop think can pursue a career in big data hadoop or rather anyone who is currently working on big data hadoop was it like previous history of exposure on java programming or apache product exposure i still have some doubts and feel skeptical while trying to explore opportunities in big data hadoop for myself i did java and egd see um what triggers someone to you know join uh, a a career in to pursue a career in big data it is nothing like that uh, basically when you see that you have some problem at hand and basically when when that problem cannot be solved using your usual tools using your usual pros your, your usual computers your usual machines that is when you realize that you need you know distributed computing you need you need distributed architecture you need much much more servers or you know much more processes processors etc to uh, basically um, solve your problem that is when you start thinking about big data you start learning about big data you start exploring you start understanding how how does big data help you uh, solve your problem so basically it is nothing uh, so basically big data is uh, you have to think of it you know like a very huge problem that you're trying to solve using your usual uh, tools but you're not able to solve it and then you start looking for other means this is how a person gradually you know transforms from transforms you know starts pursuing a career in big data If that is the case, then why not use st Storm instead of Spark? Uh, uh, Storm is a is a fairly fairly new technology. It is it is you know still um under it's I think it's under beta and stuff. So as and when you know better technologies start coming in, people start people keep moving. People based on their use cases, based on how a technology is doing, people people keep moving into uh people keep start start people do adopt other technologies. so okay hadoop can be used for only for analytics kind of projects no it's not like that hadoop can be used for um tons of tons of different types of projects yes but analytics uh, analytics is one such thing basically hadoop can be used anywhere where you want to process a lot of data where you want to answer you want your data to answer a lot of questions so um this is where basically hadoop comes into a picture so so for instance we saw that you know hadoop is used in healthcare uh, sorry big data is used in healthcare and big data could be used in you know government related uh, uh departments etc so and then you land up using hadoop for those uh, projects so it is not essentially for analytics it, it can be you know it can it is used for analytics in various different industries okay uh so uh, are there any other questions that i can answer i would love to answer uh, any more questions that you guys have Okay yeah Vipin since it's an online course uh 
you can it is available anywhere so it's basically all of it is online you can definitely get in touch with sandeep uh, sandeep giri and uh, get more details about it okay rajat is asking which is faster using hadoop with hdfs or uh, i think it is spark he, he, he means spark with uh, linux file systems such as exe3 4 mac os file systems so yes uh, using hadoop with hdfs is much faster uh, rajat please correct me if you meant spark um okay so yeah you, so basically when when you're using hadoop you you want to use it with a distributed file system so using hadoop with hdfs is much much more faster also when you're using spark you since spark is only a processing engine for your data uh, for the data you can use anything you can use any other distributed uh, st storage system you can in fact use hdfs with spark you can use uh, Amazon S3 with Spark you can use uh, Google's uh, Google Cloud storage with Spark so you can use any distributed storage with Spark uh, when you are using uh, a big data a big data processing engine like Hadoop or Spark it is it is better to use it with a big data uh, a, a big data storage engine as well so you know both the processing engine and the storage storage engine should have distributed architecture okay so i'll quickly go over the course details so the course uh, basically starts from 20th june uh, it is 7 am ist it will be a 3 hour session on saturdays and sundays uh, and uh, the uh, and the second session starts from 11th of july so you can enroll for any of these sessions it's a 33 hour session uh, sometimes it it you know it extends to a 12 uh, 12 classes so it could be a 36 hour session as well uh, you can uh, log on to uh, no big data and under the courses you can enroll for the course uh, it also includes uh, support for cloud labs uh, you will get a lifetime access to the learning management system and you will get a certificate at the end of it all of these classes are recorded and we will send you the presentations and the recordings at the end of the session so i think we have we have you know um uh, uh, basically exceeded the time that we had decided but i am still um, still available if you have any questions feel free to ask uh, for the rest of you for whom it's getting late uh, might want to drop okay uh, good good to know that you liked it thanks hari yeah um good good that you found the uh, uh, slides uh, simple to understand apologies for the little you know glitch uh in in presenting we have the desktop you know split and stuff we'll try to fix it we'll definitely fix it by the next session okay uh so it was great having all of you uh, on uh, no big data and uh, definitely very very good set of questions um, so really appreciated the questions and shows that you you were you know you guys are all and i might have missed out on some questions because there were too many questions being asked uh, apologies for that so uh, we i can i'll love to answer those questions uh, in the next session okay basuda has a question do you really have to have experience to become an architect uh like prior architecture not really vasudha so basically when i joined cubol uh, uh, i did not have um, experience as such on big data technologies in my previous organization so it's it's not really you know um, it's not mandatory but yeah it's a good to have thing 
also you can learn over time so you know you can you can start exploring like you're taking this course and then you can start exploring uh, big data technologies you can understand use cases and you can play around with hadoop and, and it is it is really not required to have experience uh, prior experience at all you can you can definitely gain it over time just basic um, database technologies or just basic programming is something that's needed basic understanding is needed any special languages to learn for becoming an architect not really so from my experience this is something that i can tell you uh, language is never never a bottleneck if you understand you know the the if you understand the problem at hand if you understand how to process the how to process it and if you understand the problem at hand you should be able to code it in any language of your choice so language should never be become a bottleneck uh, and actually uh, you can express big data problems in terms of um, uh, in terms of multiple languages like you can write them in python you can write them in you can write in fact write them in simple shell scripting you can when you do a simple you know uh, sort sort minus u on on a file uh, in unix if the if the file is too huge it becomes a big data problem so basically uh, language is never a bottleneck you can express your if you're writing hadoop for instance if you're writing map reduce jobs you can express your map reduce jobs in in any in any form you can express them in shell script you can express them in um python you can express them in java so language is not really a bottleneck so there are no special languages as such that you'll need to learn I worked on Oracle and C++ and basic subjects. So basically, you can look for a opportunity where you can make use of uh, your uh, uh, your skills. Uh, so since you know Oracle, you you definitely know a lot about you know database technologies and you know a lot about database basics and stuff. Since you know C++ and basics of Java, you obviously know how to code solutions up and stuff. So I think you you have all the basic uh, skill sets skill set that is needed. Uh, and since you've already done a course in data mining, you also understand you know how to some amount of understanding around how to analyze the data, how to derive insights out of the, out of the data, etc. so you can look for an opportunity where you can you know make use of all of these skill sets and if you if you uh, if you're taking up you can take up this course and uh, if you've already signed up for it great otherwise you can sign up for it and we will walk you you will get maybe a practical uh practical knowledge is something that you don't have so you will get that in this session okay uh, so i think we are done uh, we'll mail you the uh, recording of today's session and uh, uh, you can log on to you can visit no big data and enroll for the uh, course um great uh, thanks again all of you uh, thanks for all the appreciation thank you bye good night